Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today and for having us. So we'll start with a quick introduction before we jump into some questions, but we're excited to discuss this topic today. So I'm Inga Deakin from Molten Ventures. We are a publicly listed venture fund with about 1.2 billion uh, pounds and assets under management. We invest primarily at Series A, B, and we lead rounds, um, but we also have a seed fund program where we invest in other seed funds across Europe, uh, now in about 70 different seed funds across sectors and geographies. And we are a generalist fund, so we invest in B2B, B2C, deep tech, satellites and drones and chips, as well as health and life science, which is my focus. We take a very holistic view of health and life science, so across all the health tech themes and some of the things the last panel have been talking about. Um, and what we don't do is biotech, we do everything else. So mental health is a, is a key, key theme that we just think is going to have a massive impact in the world. I personally did a PhD in neuroscience and psychiatry, so I've been super motivated in this area for a long time. And we were delighted to, to work with Oliver and invest with Javi, and would invite him to introduce himself. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. My name is Javier Suarez. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Oliva. Oliva is a workplace mental health care platform. So we ensure that the company stays healthy, employees still healthy, and they can do their best. And that would be me. Thank you so much, Harry. So what can we talk about today is the state of mental health, just globally. The numbers are staggering, but yeah. talk to us. So you know, one of the biggest issues with mental health care is that, A, we still use research from decades ago, right? And, and the problem with that is, is that you can really see in the numbers that come out of it, right? You can see how people recover in many cases, you know, reach recovery less than 50%. Only half of people that actually struggle with it actually get to, to the first appointment. So there's friction basically along the entire way because it hasn't evolved in decades. And that's really what's keeping back uh, employees, is keeping back practitioners from being, giving them best help. And it's also really holding back businesses for being at their best. So as a, as a collective problem, it's, it's basically affecting every single individual, either indirectly or directly. And, and it's, it's time, I think, to make it for today, for, for, for humans of today, for humans of tomorrow, also given the fact that we now have much better technology. So let's talk a bit about that technology. What do you think of the technologies and innovations that can make a difference in mental health? Yeah, so I think it's really important to distinct, you know, a lot of people talk about access to mental health, that we have a really big struggle to access, right? And it is correct, but I think access without precision is not really useful, right? So, oh, so what we need to make sure is that not only we give, you know, we, we simplify the access, but the ultimate goal is for individuals to find the right type of care, the right practitioner, should a practitioner be there, and to get to the desired outcomes on the first attempt. And I think that now, with the evolution of technology, we're in the best place to do that. Um, on the other side of things, for practitioners, you know, ultimately what practitioners want to do, psychologists, counselors, etc., they want to focus on providing the absolutely best care. Problem is, is that when they come out of school, they have limited options, and they have to kind of like the majority need to open their private practice, which you know includes includes all of the admin, includes um, all of the demand generation, and and technology can really remove all that from them, making sure that they're providing the best care with the people that fit the best for them, and that will eventually get to the outcomes desired. So it removes a lot of the wastage from sessions that didn't work for both sides. Um, and I think that's what technology can really help us do. And of course, we have to talk about AI as an extension of some of the technical tools that you're talking about. What, how, do you, how do you think even about AI in this context? So I think, I think AI is just a matter of time. I definitely think a mental health care is a really good uh, um, space for the current state of AI in terms of us being able to create IP much easier that was created before. That said, so if you would kind of like chunk it into three pieces or in two pieces, you have the way of enhancing practitioners and individuals during care. And then eventually, you know, as things evolve and as technology evolves, you can actually start delegating care for it to be AI led. 
and then ultimately we serve humans for those that really need it, right? And I think that's now become a reality with AI. Um, and then I would just maybe hide that on top. In terms of the actual practitioners, you must imagine there's so much science behind, there's so much conditions behind. It's really quite impossible for these people to always be on point on every diagnosis, you know, on every decision making. So what's what we do? We assist them in real time through the entire care journey to be able to make the absolute best decision based on data, based on their past and what we've seen with others, right? And then for them, they get a very curated selection of people they can treat. And for example, with us right now, we reach 98% of the time people stay with their therapist and then 94% reach the outcomes. And that truly uh, gives you a bit the sense of what AI can, AI can do and technology combined through the care journey of practitioners and throughout the care journey of individuals. Some really fantastic uh, outcomes on both sides, improving with practitioners and also their clinical outcomes. It's very striking. Um, how do you um, cope with this sort of resistance or any of the challenges of adoption of AI? Yeah. So that's a really good question, right? So, you know, one thing that, um, you know, that is great is that we can, we can get access to really good data to get into the, into the side of care delegation, AI-led, reserve humans for the really complex cases and for the people that really need it. So creating the IP does not scare us, I guess, or, or many out there in the space doing it. What I think is a bit scarier and a bit unknown is the adoption side of things. When will really people trust at scale that AI-led hair can be as good or even better potentially than human in specific cases, right? If you must imagine, you know, AI is never tired. They'd always wake up with energy. They remember everything. The learnings compound. It can adapt much faster. So the essence is there. The hypothesis is there but we still need to see how fast at scale people are willing to adopt this and actually reach outcomes. So I think it's a careful thing. It's not like just creating technology where you simply throw you know, a new feature against the wall and see what happens. This is mental health care, right? So we've got to go a bit slower, make sure that we're testing things in the right way until we're fully confident that the IP is right and that the, way, and that the format of distribution, call it voice, text, whatever it be, is also the preferred method. Just to finish on that, what really excites me is that if you think about it, in five years from now, the workforce will be primarily 70% components of the newer generations. And these newer generations are used to working in this way, to working with technology, even treatment. So we potentially see there a big opportunity to start with the younger populations. And you could also distinguish between clinical therapy and coaching. Coaching is a bit less complex, you have a bit less risk. So it's really about taking it slow from like micro interactions and you start combining it until you can have a full dialogue that can really work as well as a human. But that will take time, right? And nobody knows right now, there still, there still needs to be a bit of technology to advance when it comes to sentiment and then the big part of adoption. It will take time, but it's just a matter of time. So that would be my take. It's a super interesting point as well about the sort of development of mental health conditions and the, the variety of different labels and conditions and severities. How do you think we can, we can tackle some of that diversity? So I think one big mistake that's happened in the past is that, uh, not big mistake, but we come from a place where people are put into categories and boxes. It's okay, you have this. And the reality is, is that mental health care is very different to physical health. In physical health, it's much easier to pinpoint and say, that's the problem and that's the solution. And that's a bit how, from the world that we come from, also in mental health, trying to resemble that. But the reality is, is that mental health is in many cases a combination of feelings, a combination of conditions. So we really have to start adapting the science from the past to the learnings of the future and the continuous learnings for us to understand how can we really craft unique care and hyper, I would say, ultra personalized care for, it, for every individual that includes a combination of conditions potentially and also their potential lifestyle and ways of living, right? So it's definitely not a one size fits all. Absolutely. And as you said, the individual has their own journey throughout their, their lifetime as well. So exactly. there's a lot of different stages. Oh, that makes sense. You know, people say that we, you know, 
you know, depending on where you see it, that 30% of humans at any given point, adults, are dealing with mental health. But if you really think about it, that's directly. Now, if you think about the indirect effect from that and the circle around them of people getting affected by them not being in the best place, it's much bigger, the effect. So I, I, I truly think it's one of the biggest things holding us back as individuals, as businesses, as an economy. But the big problem is that it's not as tangible as other things. So that's what we're trying to do. Use data, use science, technology to make it tangible, to make it obvious, for you to understand, ah, when we do this, this is what works. We're continuous learning all the time, and technology now makes that much easier. I think also that reduction in the stigma around talking about these things, as you said, with the younger generations and people being a lot more open about things is going to help with that. Progress, you know, right? of course, COVID was horrible, right? But it did two really good things. One is, is that stigma got reduced a lot because people in mass started saying, sorry for my French, I feel crap. And it was the first time that people had the courage to really say that. And the other thing that happened was that, uh, as maybe some of you can relate to, people were a bit resistant to mental health care when it comes to like video. People like, no, I connect a lot better with humans one to one. But in COVID, we were all forced to do that. So what happened is, is that the adoption of digital therapy, digital mental health, you know, it went, what would have taken 10 years, it happened in one. And now we have way more than enough data at a global scale that it is as effective to do it on a digital way. Um, and that's why, in, in a way, COVID helped that way. And then the last bit would be that new generations are just saying, you know, literally we see that they say, you don't have mental health support, I don't want the job. So it's becoming standard, right? And that's what, because if I think that many of you have seen, you know, it's extremely hard to get to therapy through the insurance, through the NHS, and of course all these, you know, the more the merrier that can help people. But if you just see the engagement and the usage of these solutions, the waiting times, right? Imagine you're feeling horribly and you have to wait 12 weeks to get help. That's just horrible. In our case, in 24, in 24 hours, you're having care with the right people, getting tracked, and so forth. Uh, um, sorry for the tangent, but yeah. <laughs> no, it, it leads on really nicely to the next question about the kind of impact that you're seeing with Oliver and your kind of customers in terms of how the employees are engaging, how the employers view that, how do they see the value? Yeah, so I think, I think the interesting thing about Oliver is, is that we didn't go into this wishful thinking and say, hey, we're going to do all with technology. The reality is, is that technology has the way to go still. So we really honed down in how can we create the best human-led care, right? And human-led care, of course, enhanced with technology, AI, and AI. And, and what we see right now is a few things. So, you know, people can get the right care in 24 hours. We're seeing people at 94% hit recovery rates. We're seeing um, companies for the, for the first time truly understanding w the correlation between employing well-being and their values and their working culture, right? Because we're able to make those correlations. It's like, hey, you say that you know, psychological safety is one of your values, but really the trend of what's happening in your company, what people are bringing up, is definitely not correlating to what you think. So all of a sudden, they start seeing, hey, uh, the reality, and, and we do things like, you know, we plug into the working tools and we can say, hey, 40% of your workforce force is working at 11 p.m. and on Saturdays. We kind of feel this might be a ticking time bomb, so we try to get in there and really prevent that from happening by giving them a lot of insights and awareness of what's coming. Should things go bad, then of course we're also very proactive and can create proactive actions for them, right? So, um, and then last but not least, we have um, the, the practitioners, right? We treat them as important. They're essential for what we do. So we've created this incredible, you know, SaaS system what, that really allows them to focus on care, see more clients. They can decide how much share of wallet they want, where they need to improve. And we really put them in the driver's seat as partners. So in a nutshell, we know we have 70 plus MPS for every single persona. We have never lost a company. Uh, in, you know, in the first week, 80% on average of every company we go to activates their account. And in 30 days, 
30% of the workforce is in one-to-one -one care. And on average, that's a static with 25%. That just shows you the people in need. But now we still need to crack a bit of prevention, right? And there we have quite a few ideas to not even get to that stage, right? And that said, people that go to care are not always bad. It could also be a bit of prevention. So um, in a nutshell, that's what we've been doing. Fantastic. It's wonderful to see the real measurable impact that you're having already. So maybe if we can fast forward a bit, I think you've talked a little bit about future vision, but as these tools are getting in increasingly clever and the technology continues to evolve, how do you see the, that role, particularly around AI and the, these tools in mental health in, say, five to ten years' time? I think the ultimate goal, like I said, is to really reserve human care for those that really need it. I don't see a world where we would completely limit humans in mental health care. I don't think it's needed, and I think that humans can play a big role. But I do see a place where we slowly transition to really eliminate for good the cost, you know, the barrier cost in access, the, you know, the precision, and just to really get people as fast as we can back to life feeling great, to get companies back producing like they should produce. And I think that all of that can be shortened by A, reducing cost, increasing efficacy, right, and, and, and at scale. And that really comes from from the power of AI, because you don't have the human constraint anymore, you, you know, you have a lot more abilities and insights to do this for this whole party. So I think we have a very, very exciting future, but I don't think we need to kid ourselves that it's going to take a bit of time, but it will happen. So I think access is coming our way at a global scale, and that really, really excites me. Fantastic. I think we can all agree there's going to be a huge impact to these technologies. And thank you so much for talking to us all about that. Is there anything else you'd like to cover at the end of the session? Yeah, maybe I'll just say one thing. You know, this whole thing started because I had a horrible burnout in the first company I created. I was in the darkest of places. I had to drag myself. And the reality is, is that I think we would all agree that it makes absolutely no sense that in today's age, mental health care is so difficult to get to, right, compared to physical health, right? It just makes absolutely no sense, and it became a life mission, right? I really want to eliminate that. I really want to every worker, employee, company to be able to use this like they would do any other service, any other gym, whatever they might be using. It needs to be as easy, if, in my opinion, if we want to have a good future a healthy future where people are happy, right? And people are doing their best. Uh, and that's really what drives me forward. It's what drives com you know, the company forward. And I think if you check us out, you'll see that really that's the tone and the mission that we're here. And we're very excited about it. So that's me and the story of Oliva. Thank you so much, Javi. It's been fantastic. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>